Good morning to all. So glad you are here today, and I'm glad that you're joining us, whether you are here or in Guthrie or you are online. I am thrilled uh, for week number three of this series that we've entitled Holy, Holy. Okay, we're going to jump into that in just a little bit. Go ahead and turn with me in your Bible to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus. Some of you have no clue where that is, or all you have heard is nightmares about that book. We're going to dive into that book today. We're going to read a lot of scripture from that book. And some of you are thinking, man, that's a boring book. No, you're boring. God's not boring. His <laughs> Leviticus chapter number 19. So we are in the home stretch right now for Easter. We're getting ready uh, for the Super Bowl for the church world in regards to people's attentiveness to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And I want to ask you, okay, to do some things. You're part of this family. As a family, we commit together. As a family, we do things together. And so as a family, I want to ask you to commit to be in here every week. Stats are showing that the person who is faithfully attending a church nowadays is attending about 1.7 times per month. <laughs> uh, that shouldn't be that way. No, no, we want you to make a commitment. We've got plenty of options for you to be able to make an experience throughout the week, whether that be the two experiences in Guthrie or Thursday night OKC or the three on Sunday at OKC. So we have options for you to be able to make it and to worship God with the family of God, okay? Secondly is this, is to volunteer, to find your niche, uh, to be able to get in and serve. And look at just as that you're serving not this church only, you're serving the kingdom of God. You're serving the body of Jesus Christ. And we believe in giving a service and receiving a service. So if you're in kids ministry, you go and you give a service, but then you come back in here and receive a service. And then thirdly, thirdly, headed toward Easter, begin to bring Begin to invite people. And don't wait for Easter Day. Next Sunday, bring somebody with you. Invite somebody. Save them a seat. Say, hey, I'm going to save you a seat. Come sit with me. And you may be even flexible to say, hey, what, what experience can you make it at? And say, I will be there at that experience to worship with you. And let's believe lives are going to be changing. I believe this. Don't just focus on one person and one person only. Uh, begin to scatter as much seed as you can. Because the more seed that you scatter, the greater the what? The greater the return. The greater the harvest that you're going to have. So begin to plant seeds uh, with the gospel and the good news and inviting people to come experience Jesus Christ. Turn with me. Leviticus chapter number 19. Verse number 1. The Lord also said to Moses... Give the following instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be, say it with me, holy, because I, the Lord your God, am, say it with me, holy. Each of you must show great respect for your mother and father. You must always observe the Sabbath days of rest. I am the Lord your God. Do not put your trust in idols. Or make metal images of gods for yourselves. I am the Lord, your God. Father, thank you for your word. And I ask God that our just ears are ready to receive. And God, then we're responsive. Responsive. And God, I ask that we put into practice those things we know. That they don't stay dormant in us. But the potential of what you have for us is realized today to be holy in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. I heard someone say, it's been years ago, it's great to get an education, but even greater to get an experience. Now let that set in for just a little bit. And as much as we value education, and I think it should be, if you get both of them together, it's even that much more of a power punch. But oftentimes, it's the education that's not as important as the experience is. 
And let's bring this to reality uh, in our lives because you can go get a business degree, okay? What is that business degree? Does it make you an entrepreneur? Does it make you the ability to be able to start things or to go out and successfully lead? No, no, no. It's usually the experience that begins to help you do that. Uh, we can talk about a lot of things. I mean, you can, I can talk to somebody how to date and prepare for dating as a, as a teenager or college student or going out and asking people out as a single person. But all, bottom line is at some point you've got to experience it. You've got to do it, okay? You've got to put yourself in that position, that awkward moment of asking somebody, talking to somebody, initiating a conversation with somebody. It, it could be as a parent. I mean, you can read all the books on parenting and how to raise children, but until you have experienced raising children, you really don't actually fully comprehend what it takes because they can't put everything in a book. Uh, when it comes to being a dentist or a dental hygienist or anything in the medical field, we often say that they're not just physicians, they are, what, practicing physicians. So they go to class for a couple of years, but they spend many, many, many more years before they're actually licensed and credentialed, they will actually spend in residency, they are practicing. And even when they finish the residency, they're still practicing physicians, which is very discouraging. So that means every time you go to the doctor or the optometrist or someone else, they are practicing on you. They're learning on you. Okay. The Thursday night at 7.30 thought that was much more funny than you did. Thursday night, 7 o'clock, let me correct that. I had, I've thought this, and maybe you have too, because all of us wish this. Have you ever thought this? I wish I knew then what I know now. I wish I knew then what I know now. And you may have even had some book knowledge and understanding of what you're going, but there's something about the experience. And what I want to talk to you today is I'm going to entitle this message, I'm practicing. Because as a Christian, I'm practicing. I'm working at this. I'm trying. And we have given the definition of holy. Let's look at that definition again. Holy is this. It means to be dedicated or consecrated to God, set apart, or to separate. So when we talk about holiness, holiness is not that I'm pure, I'm perfect, I make no mistakes. Oftentimes we've mislooked at that word, and that's not what God is speaking of. Because we're never going to arrive to that, but we have been made the holiness, righteousness in Christ, not by our own works. But at the same time, we have chosen to separate ourselves from the world and dedicate ourselves unto God. That's what makes us holy. It's the holiness of Christ and our decision to say, I'm not going to be a part of this world. I'm going to separate myself unto Christ. I'm going to look at three areas just real quick. We're going to do a kind of an overview of what we've been discussing for the last few weeks. But the first thing is this. When it comes to holiness, there is positional holiness. Positional holiness. So just an example of that is that I go and my kids sign up for a basketball team or the band or some other activity. The moment they are received on that team, okay, they are a part of that team, right? Now, my son or my child or yours can be a basketball player now because they've signed up, but really what kind of basketball player are they? But they are a basketball player and they're a part of that team. Now, are they Michael Jordan? No. You know what they have? They have goals. They have goals of seeing people in the NBA play basketball and watching Russell Westbrook. And so they see this and they say, that's my goal. But that does not demean the fact that they still are a basketball what? Player. They're still a part of that. I have a friend of mine who went to high school with, Ron Franklin, who played for the St. Louis Cardinals baseball. He was a two-time uh, all-star, but in his last year, he went through in 2011, they won the World Series, but he never saw the field. He didn't play one inning and didn't pitch, throw one ball. But when it was all said and done, he got a ring just like everyone else. And he has a World Series ring, though he never saw the field. Do you think that for a moment he thought, discouraged, I don't deserve that? That's not mine. I don't feel a part of this. I didn't actually get to play on the game. You know, he didn't do that. 
He, with pride, wears that ring and shows it off because he is a world champion, because he was on the team. Oftentimes, we allow the enemy, the devil, to discourage us because we're part of the family of God, but we look at others who we feel like are so much more successful. They're doing a whole lot more. They seem to be more spiritual, more, quote, holy. They seem to be the ones with all the talents and gifts, and so I'm a little bit less than. I take a back seat to. Let me tell you something. If you're part of the family of God and a part of his team, positionally, you're made holy in God, and on the day of judgment, you're going to see a crown of righteousness just like anyone else because you're on the team, the family of God. Come on. Secondly is this, progressive holiness. So you got the uh, positional holiness, but you also have progressive holiness. So therefore, while my child or somebody has signed up to be a part of that team, That's not the end goal. If you're a little basketball player, your end goal is not, oh, I'm just on the team. No, no, no. The the goal is to be the Westbrook, to be the Michael Jordan, to be the, you want to grow in your capacity to be all that you can possibly be. I have a guy in our church, terrific gentleman. Joe Brettlinger, who is absolutely amazing, rocking it out in Guthrie, America, at North Church up there, and Joe, you're incredible. And he's been doing some work around my house for me. He had just some concrete poured, some just a bunch of stuff that needed to be done. And I received a text from him as I'm leaving the house the other day. And, and, and as that text comes to me, he is apologizing to me. And he says, Pastor, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get a bunch of that stuff cleaned up. And I've got to get back over this morning. I'm going to be doing that. Don't worry about that. And I texted him back and I said, Joe, never apologize for progress. Never apologize. So many times in our Christian walk, we begin to apologize for progress. Or we don't even see the progress that's happened because we just see the mess around us. You know what? We're all a mess that is in the hands of God. And he has taken us and he is forming us and making us into what he wants us to be. Make no apologies for your progress. No, make no apologies when you show up for church. Just because you had some bad thoughts this week. Because you didn't do the right things this past week. No, no, no. Keep showing up because you are a piece of God's masterpiece that is in progress. And you are becoming all that God wants you to be. There may be a mess around you. You may have failed in some relationships. You may struggle in your walk to some degree. But keep walking and keep getting up and don't let the devil distract you with the mess that's around you. Keep focused that God has positionally made me holy and progressively he's making me into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. You want to write this down. God is not expecting perfection, but he does expect, say it with me, progress. So I put my kid in school. They're a school in school, but Do I expect them never to do anything with that? No, no, no. I expect them to do something with that. When Jesus Christ redeemed you and made you part of the family of God, he also expects you to grow in that process. That's what being holy is about. That's what separation is about. Thirdly is this. So we got positional holiness. we got progressive holiness. And the third one is practical holiness. Practical holiness. This is... Very important to understand. Uh, In fact, you want to write this down. Okay, Holiness is a measure of our passion for God and how we treat people. Holiness is a measure of our passion for God and how we treat people. Now, let let me just qualify that for a little bit. When Jesus was asked about the greatest command, what did he say? Okay, there's 613 commands in the Old Testament, and Jesus pulled it down to two. And he said what? Love God? With what? All. All your heart, soul, mind, passion. Fully in. And he said the second is likened to it. Love your neighbor as what? Okay, how are you going to treat people around you? How are you going to treat your spouse? How are you going to treat your mom and dad? How are you going to treat your kids? How are you going to treat your roommate? How are you going to treat people you work with, go to school with? What are you doing with that? It's a measure of our separation from this world and dedication unto God. Dedication to God. So, I was thinking about Jesus' prayer when he, the disciples asked him, how do we pray? How do we pray? And Jesus said this, this is how you pray. Okay? 
Pray like this. Our Father who art in what? Hallowed be your, thy kingdom come, thy, say it with me. What's the rest of it? Okay, most of you said on earth as it is where? In heaven. Which is the translation, but I learned it by the King James. And the King James doesn't say on earth. It says in earth as it is in And the King James is one right there that may give us a better translation and understanding of what Jesus was meaning when he said that prayer, in earth as it is in heaven. Because here's the issue. When we think about God's will on earth, we say God's will on earth, that God's will be done out there in Brother Gary, in, in, other, in Chad, and, and may that God's will be done in other people's lives. No, 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 no. No, the actual translation, little translation, is may your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You see, because when Jesus made us, when God made us, he formed us out of the dust of the ground and breathed life into us, and we're dirt. All we are is earth. We are earth that has the breath of God in us, and so we need to start praying, God, may your will be done in me, in my earth, as it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. So, let's go back to Leviticus chapter 19. We're going to read a lot of scripture today. Lots of scripture. Lots of scripture. In Leviticus 19, it's boring, right? Well, let's find out how boring it is. Maybe it's just you that is boring, okay? Um, I have a pastor friend of mine who was like a grandfather to me because my grandfather died when I was four years of age. And he spent a lot of time in our family, lots of time. And he pastored for years in California and Colorado and then also in Oklahoma. Incredible man of God. And he mentored me when I started preaching. And one of the things he always said to me is he said, he said these words. He said, Rodney, read lots of scripture when you preach because it will be the best thing you say. <laughs> and it is true. Read lots of scripture because it will be the best thing you say. Verse number nine. Let's look at this. Practical. We're talking about practicing holiness here. Holiness. When you harvest the crops of the land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of the fields and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. It is the same with your grape crop. Do not strip every branch of grapes from the vines and do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. Now, some of these scriptures, we think, how does that equate? Most of these is going to be very straightforward, but how does that fix into our culture? Basically, God is saying this, that there needs to be awareness for us among us that has, has the ability, okay, to give opportunity to and awareness for those that are in need. Specifically, God has a heart for the poor and for the foreigner that are among us. Verse number 11, do not steal, do not deceive or cheat one another. Do not bring shame on the name of God by using it to swear falsely, I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not make your hired workers wait until the next day to receive their pay. Stop there for just a moment. For many that may be listening to me, your executive, your paid salaried positions, no big deal. But among us in our culture, there are a whole lot of people that live day-to-day -day on day-to-day -day wages. And God is saying here, you better be careful again for the poor. And you better make sure that you give them what they deserve in a right, timely manner. And many times that may be daily, if not weekly. So, Do not insult the deaf or cause the blind to stumble. You must fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not twist justice in legal matters by favoring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. Always judge people, say it with me, fairly. Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is being threatened. I am the Lord. Did you get that? How many times have I seen or heard about people being beat up or, and people standing back watching what's going on in front of them? 
Now, I don't know because I haven't been in that situation exactly, but you know what? The Bible's speaking very clearly. We better be very careful to step in for issues of injustice and help people in need. Do not nurse, okay, come on, get this. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Let that sink in for just a moment before I move on. Confront people directly so you'll not be held guilty for their sin. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite. But love your neighbor as, sit with me, yourself. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. You realize when Jesus was asked the question about the greatest command, he goes back to obscure verses in the Old Testament. And for the first one, he goes to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse number 6. And he says, okay, here's the first one. Love the Lord your God with all. That's the passion. Here it is. Boom. Right there. And then for the second one, he goes to the book of Leviticus. Chapter 19. Verse number 18. And he picks it out and he says, now, love your neighbor as yourself. And the second is likened to the first. Ouch. Let's continue to read. Let's go back to verse number 30. Let's skip down to verse number 30. You can read the rest of this when you go home today. It says, keep my Sabbath days of rest and show reverence toward my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Now stop there for just a moment. He's saying there's one day you need to stop producing. And you need to kick back. And you need to go to the house of God. And you need to worship with the people of God. And you need to be there. And it, this is God saying this. This is not me. So when I'm asking you to be faithful, it's not to stroke my ego or make me feel good. I'm going to be preaching whether you show up or not. And when you show up, I'm still going to be preaching here. I'm still going to be doing my thing. We're going to be open the word of God. What you need is you need to be here because God said you need to be here. He designed you that way. And when you go outside of God's design, you are breaking his precepts. And it costs you. Okay? So, here, let's continue on. Do not defile yourselves by turning to medians or to those who consult the spirits of the dead. I am the Lord your God. Stand up in the presence of the elderly and respect and show respect for the aged. I expect all of you to stand up for me now. Just kidding. Fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not take advantage of foreigners who live among you in your land. Treat them like native-born Israelites and love them as you love yourself. This is heavy stuff. Remember that you were once foreigners living in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or volume. Your scales and weights must be accurate. Your containers for measuring dry materials or liquids must be accurate. I am the Lord your God. God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, you must be careful to keep all my decrees and regulations, putting them into, say it with me, practice. I am the Lord. Come on. That's good reading. And we are shouting today at North Church. We're hitting home with some of this stuff. Pastor Clint, a couple of weeks ago, said in one of our staff meetings, he was talking about his two smallest children, um, Lila and Russell, and how that they, no matter how cold it is, no matter what it is, they always know to go get their jacket. Mom and dad don't even have to tell them to go get their jacket. They go get their jacket. They got their jacket. But he said it's the funniest thing because they go get their jacket and they drag their jacket out to the car and wherever they were, but they never put their jacket on. So they just jack, drag their jacket with them. Because they know the necessity to have their jacket, but they never really put it on. And I think when it comes to holy living, we know all the right things, and we kind of drag the truth along with us, but we never really clothe ourselves with the truth of God's word and put it on us and wear the holiness with us day in, day out, in practical, everyday living. And we got to put God's word into practice. So when it comes to God's word, he's given us three things to help you. Three things to help you live this holy life, because you can't do it in yourself. You cannot do it in yourself give you three things. Number one is this. Number one, he's given you a pattern. He's given you a 
pattern. And speaking of patterns, how many know if you're going to build a house, you've got to have what? Plans. Okay, drawings. It's a pattern so that somebody can do that with. Uh, if you are going to sow, what, what do you need to sow something? You need a what? A pattern to go off of because some of you ladies, I'm sure you're sewing all of your clothes every single week. That's what we do at North. We're those type of people. We make our, I got a feeling there's hardly any, you talk to me if you are making your own clothes. Most of you are not. That, but we have patterns. How about when it comes to cooking? What do you need? A recipe. That's a pattern, right? It's a pattern. In fact, I, I actually, now I've, I grill, I've grilled for years, like the steak, and that's what men do. That's, men are limited to a few things. And so I do that stuff. But I actually made some Daniel Fast approved no-bake cookies recently, and here's my picture of what I needed. Here's my stuff, and I put like two and a half cups of oatmeal, uh, six tablespoons of uh, unsweetened organic cocoa, uh, sprinkling of unsweetened uh, coconut flakes, and then half a cup of almonds, and then I had a tablespoon of chia seeds, and then I took some ingredients that was my that was my dry ingredients, and then I took the peanut butter, I took a cup of honey, took a, or a half a cup of honey, I took um, some vanilla, and then I took coconut oil and put it in a pan, kind of heated it up a little bit, kind of melted it all together, and then I took my dry ingredients and stuff, and I mixed it together, and I did all this. I'm so proud. I'm telling you this because I'm proud of myself. I mixed it all together, and then I took it in little scoops and put it on, you know, a sheet, pan sheet, and, and just kind of, I don't even know the terminology for some of the stuff in the kitchen, but I'm trying my best. And so I put it on a little sheet, cookie sheet thing, and then put it in the uh, refrigerator to let it cool and stuff. And I'm telling you, it is absolutely over-the-top awesome food. I love it. It's incredible. And actually, I thought I did just as good as anyone else I've ever. It was awesome. I just got it tapping on the back. Here's the amazing thing about a pattern. When you're following the exact pattern, anybody can do it. It may have taken me a little longer than somebody else because I was continuing going back and forth and getting this right, measuring. I was trying to figure out what a tablespoon was. Okay? I was trying to figure out some of those things. And it took me a little longer than maybe somebody who is an expert who can just throw it together, put it in, boom, and be done. It took me a little bit longer, but I can still do it. And here is the good news for you. All of us have been given a pattern. And all of us are on the same page. It doesn't matter where you come in your walk. There's no excuses. We've all been given two things. We've been given God's word and we've been given Jesus Christ in flesh who is the word of God. And the word of God is here. It's spelled out for us. Some of us may be a little bit slower than other people. Some of us may struggle a little bit more than others, but we have no excuse. A life of holiness is found in God's word and found by the example that Jesus Christ has given us and we can all do it. The pattern has been given to us. Number two is this, people. So number two is people. A few weeks back, matter of fact, a couple of months ago, about, no, about a month and a half ago, I mentioned something about flossing and my new commitment to floss and how that I failed in the past and my dentist was saying I need to do this and so I committed to flossing. It is amazing when I preach and I tell some little stories that may be just like two minutes, that people latch hold of those stories and like they remember that. Okay, you don't remember the word that I preach, don't remember the scripture, have no clue of that, but you remember the crazy stories that I tell. And one of those was on the flossing. And I have had so many people bring me floss. And some people brought me those type of floss that's not the kind that wrap around your finger. Because, you see, I've, I've kind of, I've stepped my, up my game. I no longer do the kind that wrap around my finger that, that cut off all my blood circulation and my fingers turn blue. I, I don't use those anymore. I actually have upgraded to the top that's just this little stick that kind of goes in and does my teeth. And it's absolutely over the top awesome. And I want to say thank you for all of you because now I have a year's supply of dental floss. <laughs> and what I've noticed also about the people of God, when you found out my struggle, you started responding. I appreciate that. And another thing I appreciate is that almost every single week, somebody asks me, Pastor, have you been flossing? Even a few weeks ago when I went to Guthrie to be in church with them, 
I get up there, and people came up to me and said, Pastor, have you been flossing? You know what you're doing? You're giving me the tools to do the job, and then secondly, you're helping me stay accountable. You're helping me stay accountable. And you know what? When it comes to living a holy life, we need each other. That's why you need to be in church. That's why you need to be in a north group. That's why you need to be, the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another. And let me just say this. It's not even the people that are for you that sharpen you. Also, it's the people that are against you that are going after you that can make you better. Throughout the word, it points that out, is that oftentimes it's even our enemy that can drive us to our knees. It's our enemy that causes us to look inside and to forgive and to be merciful and compassionate. And you know what's happening? Is every time the enemy comes at us, we are just being told and being fashioned more into the image of Jesus Christ. Come on. People. Thirdly is this. So you got the pattern, you got people. Thirdly is power. Power. Gary Nelson spoke to our, he's our trustee, one of our trustees, and he spoke to our directors this past week. And of course, he was speaking on leadership, and at the very end, we had Q&A time. And Gary doesn't boast in, you know, his accomplishments, and, but he's, he's started businesses and sold them off, and he's done extremely well over the years. He's highly respected across the Oklahoma City metro community and, and throughout uh, the business world across Oklahoma and, uh, and beyond. And so we had an open time afterwards, and people started asking, staff started asking questions. Well, one of the questions a staff member asked was about uh, Diana and her role and responsibility and helping, you know, and, and basically Gary just kind of stopped breathing in a little bit, and he said, you know, Diana, while I was traveling all over the world, she was faithfully home taking care of and raising the children. And she, he made this statement. He said, I could not have done what I did without her. There's no way. Let me tell you something. When it comes to you living a life of holiness, you cannot do what you do without the power of the Holy Spirit in you. The power of the Holy Spirit in you. You're not going to do it. You're, you're, you're not going to make it. You cannot. I talked about just last week. When we were all created out of the dust of the ground, God breathed into us life. And at that moment, every single person that's ever actually lived was breathed into them a God consciousness. That's why it says that God has placed the eternity, eternity in the hearts of all men. That's why it says in Romans that God has written his commandments on the hearts of every person. Now, there's a whole lot of things that may influence that. as your upbringing, hardening your own heart over time. But you can go around the world and there is an awareness, there's a God consciousness inside of individuals. The second breath of the Holy Spirit was when Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit after his resurrection when they believed in him. And there's a breath of the Holy Spirit that breathes eternal life on every single person who chooses to receive him as Lord and Savior. But there's an ongoing move of the Holy Spirit in our lives that convicts us unto righteousness that gives us courage to live a godly life through the power of the Holy Spirit found in Acts chapter 2 where the Holy Spirit breathed on those individuals and the Holy Spirit is breathing on individuals right now if you let power I, I was this couple of weeks ago I went to get my teeth cleaned and the dentist was like or the hygienist was asking me about how I brush my teeth which I've never been asked that before. They actually brought in a battery operated, because I told them I used a battery operated, and I just had started a few years before. They brought in a battery operated and wanted me to show them how I brushed my teeth, which I thought was very odd, very awkward, but I did. And when I start brushing my teeth, I do it with this battery operated, just like I normally do. And she stops me and she says, no, 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 that's not how you do it with this. 
And so what I have been doing over the years since I had this battery-operated toothbrush is that I continue to use that like I used my regular toothbrush. I did all the work. I did all the work. Because here's my view, okay? If I continue to do my normal process of brushing my teeth, and then I also use it with a battery that's actually super powered, then I can actually get my teeth done quicker. I brush my teeth. I can just get done fast. So what I used to do in two minutes, I can get done in like 30 seconds. And that may be weird thinking, but that's what I kind of thought. She, she, she clarified this. She said, no, 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 no. No, you need to stop doing the work, and you just need to let it set on your teeth and let the power of the toothbrush do the work and just let it move around your mouth. I think it's when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Most of us have the Holy Spirit, but we're still trying to do in the flesh what only the Holy Spirit can do. And you just need to kick back and let God do his work. Now, does that mean nothing of you? Oh, no, 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 no. There's something of you. The Holy Spirit will speak to you, challenge you, call you out, and you got to obey. 